and the discipline of women, my father knew, as every sensible man knows, the strength of the sexual passions. Nature ever tends to the preservation of the races of animals. Opportunity, notwithstanding this sentimentalism about intimate chastity, is the cause of most of the lapses from virtue. Americans must soon learn this lesson, or we are ruined. Reserved and rather stern towards his children, he was yet much devout, devoted to their true interests, and under a hard bearing, he had much tenderness towards them. He never struck me a blow but once. Having imported a fine merino buck, he had him tied to a tree, and whilst he was at dinner, seeing that the buck a little belligerent, I was in the act of inviting a trial of hardness of heads with the sheep. But my father, returning and seeing my danger, with the flat of his hand knocked me further than the sheep could probably have done. Some of the culminations of my facel will said on hearing this in afterlife that my father took needless precautions for my head would have been proved too hard for the buck. He was early convinced of the destructive and exhaustive culture of tobacco and among the first to do so, expelled it from the land, his lands. So he saw that the use of the infernal weed, prostrating the nervous system, led in a broad road to drunkenness and disease, and hence his embargo against its use. He was also very successful in the breeding of pigeons and bees, saying that these were the cheapest operatives working for nothing and finding themselves he was fond of fruits and flowers and trees and attempted landscape gardening but it was the false french rectangular kind he had no idea of the effort effects of forests on the production of rain moisture etc in agriculture but believed in the future value of timber and many acres if kept in the original trees in fact would sell now for four believed in the future of value of timber and many acres if kept in the original trees in fact would sell now for more than the land itself he had no taste for hunting and gunning and looked upon them as a waste of time but he was not averse to music and dancing as he died while i was yet quite young i knew but little of his early life the tradition is that he was inspired by a love of vivid the tradition is that he was inspired with a love of adventure in consequence of boone's visit to the wilds of kentucky and my grandfather, a slaveholder, for some trivial offense, put him with the women and children to pick in cotton, then cultivating for family uses, which offended him. At all events, he migrated whilst yet a minor to Kentucky for his success in political and civil life See American Cyclopedia and Collins History of Kentucky. After the death of my father in about my 17th year, I entered Transylvania University at Lexington, Kentucky. Alva Wood was then president, succeeding Dr. H. Holley, who had gained it quite a reputation. Being a brilliant scholar of fine presence and quite conversational powers, he was quite a figure in the elegant society for which Lexington was then noted as the center of wealth and refinement of the state, Louisville and Covington being then but villages. Wood was also a New Englander, but very different man from Hawley, a fine scholar, but quite modest and reserved in his manners and bearing. He was very rigid in his discipline and examinations and turned out some finely instructed students in the short time that he was 
in the chief palace, when he was in the chief place. Among those in my class were N.L. Rice, who became somewhat notorious in his debate with the illustrious Alexander Campbell at Lexington, where Henry Clay presided as moderator and chairman. This debater, Rice, whom I heard was a close, silent, and severe student, but he made no mark in college. Lewis Rogers of Louisville was a distinguished physician and died in old age and was respected there by everyone. He was a member of my class and was the constant with myself for the first place in scholarships. It was a hard-fought battle between us, but no public announcement of our relative rank was made as Dr. Wood being called to the better-paid presidency of the Alabama University left us in the senior year before the time of graduation. But as he offered me the first place in the professorships of his new university, perhaps I may not be presumptuous in claiming precedence in scholarship in Transylvania. During my residence in Lexington, I had the good fortune to know and see some of Kentucky's most no, noted orators, Henry Clay, Robert J. Beckenridge, Robert Wick Wycliffe, Jess Bledstow, John Pope, and William T. Berry. Here, also, I first saw and made the acquaintance of Mary Jane Warfield, the daughter of Elijah Warfield, who bred the celebrated racehorse Lexington, the best horse sportsmen say that ever lived. Miss Warfield, the second sister, was three years my junior, of medium size, graceful movement, and gay, fascinating manners, which are so noted in Irish women. She seemed equally pleased with me, and with a few lines from Byron on the blank leaves of Washington Urban sketchbook, if I remember right, I left her and Lexington and joined Yale College in Yankee Land in the year of 1831, entering the junior class. Having letters of introduction to so many distinguished men of both parties, I carried one also to Andrew Jackson, Old Hickory, who was then President of the United States. My family, father, brothers, etc., were all Whigs. Henry Clay Wiggs, and when I, having sent my letters, was ushered in the president of the president by his successor, Martin Van Buren, I was fearful that a Clay would receive quite a cold reception from Harry's old foe. But it was all to the contrary. Jackson was as courteous, affable, and agreeable as possible, and after inquiring about many of my acquaintances, whom he knew, but nothing about Henry, Harry, where I was going, and what I was proposed in my journey east. He dismissed me by telling Mrs. Van Buren to take care of me. I was surprised and delighted with Jackson, and did not wonder at his great popularity with the public and personal friends. As I approached him, he rose, took me by the hand, and seated me. He was a striking figure and above six feet high, of fine build and military carriage. His hair gray, cut and standing up, as all his portraits show it. His head high and expansive, showing the great intellectual and his moral powers, rather than that bulldog courage which has always been attributed to him. But I need not dwell upon a man so well known and so often painted by world, word and pencil. After I learned more of his life, and he had by reflection and experience become a better equipped as a critic, I think I may have may say that Jackson was a man of eminent moral courage rather than physical, though he had ample store of each. Man, like other animals, has a mental 
structure from the brain and nerves, and also a physical structure, the brain, nerves, and muscles being more united in the last. Dr. Joseph Rhodes Buchanan, I think, has proven beyond cavall that the anterior brain is the place of the intellect and the posterior portion resting upon the neck is that which regulates the muscles, the senses, the sensual and the sensuous sentiments, actions, and passions. Whilst rejecting the elaborate subdivisions of the brain, which phrenology claims, I think these two grand divisions of craniology must be accepted as facts. In the bulldog, we have the immense neck and posterior development of the brain, which impels him to sudden and unreflecting brute force and courage. But in the shepherd, the spaniel, and the St. Bernard, we see the light, lighter neck and the facial angle of the brain more elevated, approximating in degree the human face divine. The whole memoirs of Jackson show that he acted accordingly to his facial, or rather higher cranial structure. He was not quick to resent injuries, far less to rush into personal assault, but on the contrary was quite well poised and cautious in difficulties when force was to be used. He showed this in his Indian Wars and also in his battle at New Orleans. But being in, he exerted all his moral forces and all his physical powers to the fullest extent. So he attacked the British unawares before a great battle of the 8th, not so much to demoralize those trained veterans as to prove in one-sided and partial success to his new troops that these redcoats were not invincible. Then again, on account of the situation of the ground, the British must advance at right lines in the front or not at all. So he wisely entrenched and fortified so he wisely entrenched and fortified with the celebrated cotton bales which were not only accessible, but the finest possible material for the purpose. The result of all the world knows. And this mental foresight in resisting force or other obstructions of a mental or sentimental caste is moral courage. And this all great statesmen and generals have exhibited, notably Caesar, Hannibal, Napoleon, and others. And Lodi, the bridge, must be passed, or the battle lost. And the battle lost to the enemy's country, with an army numerically greater, greatly inferior, and far from recruits or supplies, all was lost. Hence the little corporal went into the fight, first with the moral and then with the brute courage united, and fortune stood by his side. Henry Clay had equal moral courage with Jackson, but he lacked military glory, and with ignorant majority, military glory is appreciable, while the moral courage and intellectual statesmanship are incomprehensible. In such conflict, Jackson, of course, triumphant. Had Mr. Clay accepted the generalship in chief in the War of 1812, as proposed by his friends, the President Madison being one, there is no doubt but he would have made a great successful general for all men who ever came into political rivalry in our country. Henry Clay and Andrew Jackson were the most alike in character. Of all the generals who have ever lived, Julius Caesar was the greatest, and he was great in all the departments of human effort, great as a lawyer, great as an orator, great as a historian, and great, greatest as a general. In social circle, among men and women, he had no superior, 
handsome, affable, considerate, and magnific- magnetic. Whilst in battle, he was quick, stern, and inflexible for first anticipating all obstructions, then rushing like exploding dynamite upon his astonished foes. Jackson and Clay, if they had the equal talent of Caesar, had not his opportunities, and after all, fate plays a great and unknown part in human affairs, and men are rather the sequences than the directors of events. Later in life, I knew Thomas H. Benton. On the same occasion, I was introduced to John C. Calhoun, who was quite courteous to me. Still, as I had no admiration for the man's principles, I made my visit short. His person was good, and his face intellectual and expressive, but he left no great impression on my memory. As we were in antagonizing all our lives on great and conflicted principles, I say no more about him. Mr. Van Buren invited me to a family dinner, his three sons being at table, among who was Prince John, as he was familiarly called by his friends, whom I afterward met in Russia, and after of whom I shall speak again. Van Buren was kind but reserved, and I only remember his rather square German face and head. And here I was struck with the difference manner as of the North and the Smith South, which continue to this day. The Russians of the higher class are more like Southerners than the Southerners are like the Northerners. In Baltimore, I made the acquaintance of Reverend Dre Johnson and his most agreeable family and other men of less note. In Philadelphia, I carried letters to John Sargent and I was introduced to the Ingersolls, Biddles, and other distinguished families who left no impression upon me. New York was democratic and then provincial compared to Philadelphia, and I carried no letters there. Passing New Haven, I went to Boston and formed a very large circle of acquaintances. I carried letters to John Quincy Adams, George Thicknor, and others. I saw Mr. Adams on my second visit to Boston after I had begun political life at his own home at Quincy, and I spent over an hour with him. At that time, I never had been there since. The famous man, though wealthy, lived in a framed house of very humble pretenses and an agreeable group of trees and shrubbery. The ceiling was very low, being much less airy than my own house. I found Mr. Adams at home and waiting in the hall to send in my card and letters. In a very short time, I was in the presence of the statesman, whom I so admired as the friend of Henry Clay. He is too well known to call for my impressions of his person. He received me with a smile and talked long and familiarly with me. But after such a lapse of time, but little remains on my memory. I only recall that he told me he never missed an appointment in his life. I know, I, knowing the careless habits of the South in that respect, said to him, You, of course, speak of appointments to speak. No, returned he, but in the transactions of life, I make it a rule to be prompt at the time named. This made such an impression on me that I determined that I would have, I would imitate him myself. And I can now say that I have made more public speeches than any man in America, except in the public lectures, maybe so called, and I have never misused, I have never missed an appointment. I was always ready to move, and to move on the first conveyance, so that if the first boat, car, or stage broke down, I would have the chance the next, and if there were no other trains of conveyance, I had at least 
all chances of repair of the ones used. Once, however, whilst lecturing in New York with all my precautions and misused connection, I missed connection and was about to lose my appointment. I was getting them from 50 to $100 for each lecture, a large sum then for anyone and I lost not only my hundred dollars but was likely to lose the next series or part of it so going to a railroad office I paid fifty dollars for a special car and so down in time the audience a full house were all in and waiting for me. The time was nearly up, and many said, He cannot come, the train is in, and the clay is not in it. Here, a friend of mine, knowing my punctuality, said, I will be, I will bet a hundred dollars that clay will be in time by the clock. The bet was made, and in I walked. My friend, who afterward told me the circumstance, said, I handed back the money, telling the loser that it was not fair to take it up on a certainty of the result. When I spoke in Ohio in 1876, I was 40 miles away from my appointment, and there being no stage, boat, or railroad in that direction, all of my friends said it was impossible. But I got there in time by carriage with relays of horses, so in 1875, I was at Memphis, and my appointment was at Green, Greenville, Mississippi. All, I, all said it was useless to attempt it. Yet, after 48 hours' struggle, I was in the presence of my expectant audience and received with great enthusiasm. So in all my life work, I have not recognized the impossible till fate had finally decided something of this is no doubt constitutional but much was the result of illustrious example as this visit was probably in 1844 after i'd entered upon my anti-slavery career mr adams paid me the compliment of saying he regarded me as one of the pillars of the temple of american liberty at my first visit to Boston, I carried the letters of Daniel Webster and made his acquaintance, but of him I shall say more hereafter. I found George Tickenor in his Boston home. I will remember his massive high forehead and distinguished bearing. As a private ball at his house, I met again Daniel Webster. He had the largest private library I have ever seen. The whole walls were a large room being filled with books. Then and afterwards, I met and made the acquaintance of most of Boston's distinguished men and women. Whittier, the poet, the Quincy's, the Ott, Dr. Howe, and his famous wife, Julie Ward H., whom I visited at their country home. John J. Palfrey, John A. Andrew, and Edward Everett, with all three of whom I afterwards had corresponded, correspondence, as well as with the Quincy's Phyllis ETC, William Lloyd Garrison, Robert Winthrop, Judge Benlow, and his accomplished lady, whose guests Miss, Mrs. Clay and myself were in 18... 44, and Charles Sumner, who afterward visited me in Kentucky. I saw Rufus Chocolate. I saw Rufus Chico I saw Rufus Chote, the lawyer, but was never presented to him. I will remember his large frame and great thoughtful eyes, but never heard him speak. It was much later in life when I met my eccentric and distinguished friend Benjamin F. Butler, who, like the German carpenter, 
is like to live a hundred years and keep the waters muddy and turbulent all the time.